these last three months have been very hard for a lot of people. And it seems likely that life will get still harder for many as the economic fallout begins to kick in. And so it's a really important question to ask, um, what resources do we have to cope with suffering and the personal sorrow that that brings? Okay, what resources do our friends and our family um, have? Do, what, what, what resources do our community have? Uh, actually, one of the striking things about Western ideology at the moment is how poorly it equips people for suffering. Actually, pretty much the only thing it has to say about suffering is that you should avoid it if you can. But Christian truth has, has resources to richly equip us in the face of personal suffering and sorry. And this week we're looking together at Psalm 42, one of many Psalms of lament in the Bible that grapple deeply with the reality of suffering um, and sorrow in, um, in our world. But Psalm 42 fits within the biggest story of the whole Bible. And actually understanding that broader framework is going to help us to appreciate what the psalmist is able to do in the face of his own personal um, sorrow. So we're going to quickly look at the, the kind of big picture, then we're going to zoom back to Psalm um, 42. And we see that the, the overall story of the Bible is one of loss and redemption. We created the loss when we rejected um, God as king and forfeit the perfect life that we, he, had, uh, he had created. And that led us to a world marked instead by sin, by judgment, and by death. And so the Bible tells us actually the hardships that we experience in life, this sense of loss, it's not just how it is, it's because there has been something lost. There is something wrong. This cosmic um, loss that we um, experience in lots of kind of small instances day by day. So that, that's the loss. But God also brings redemption. And as, as, as many of us know, Jesus dies on the cross. He faces our sin, our judgments, our death in our place. Um, we have a God who himself became a man of sorrows, familiar with suffering. And that means that we can now enjoy redemption. But here's the thing, for a believer who, who trusts in Jesus, at that point, a story of redemption begins in our lives. And yet, whilst we live in this world, the story of sorrow and loss continues. We live in this overlap, both at the same time. Now, one day when Christ returns, all of this will be done away with um, forever at that point. But until then, we experience, um, we experience both the joy of God's redemption, the promise of his salvation, and the reality of suffering and sorrow and hardship. Now, as, as we kind of think about Psalm 42, of course, it's an Old Testament believer. Um, he lives before the cross of Jesus. Um, so rather than looking back to the cross, he instead has God's promises of redemption that he has to trust and look forward to. So it's a slightly different picture for him, but nonetheless, a similar story. And the big picture, this big picture of loss and redemption is crucial to our response to suffering and sorrow. And we see that in this in this refrain that keeps coming back in Psalm 42. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Well, because there is loss. Loss is, is real. It's okay. In fact, it's important to be honest um, about the troubles and sorrows that you're experiencing. We're realistic about that because we know that they're a regular part of this, this broken world. But at the same time, you see, he says, put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. And that's because we can have real hope because uh, not only is, um, is, our, is our world marked by loss, but also this wonderful promise of, um, of redemption. 
And this, um, this, this wonderful balance we see as we actually look at the details of, of this first stanza, we'll finish our time together by just looking at this now. Now, we don't know exactly the situation that the psalmist is in, um, but we do see the emotional impact uh, that it's having on him. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, where is your God? That is a very striking image, isn't it? My tears have been my food consistently, day and night. And part of the thing contributing to that is what we see here. He feels spiritually disconnected, removed from, from God, like a, like a deer longing for, thirsting for water. So he feels the absence of God um, like water that his soul longs for. For a believer, actually, our walk with God is foundational and fundamental to our lives. And so to go through an experience where we feel cut off from him, distant from him, can be agony. That's the psalmist's experience here. Of course, it was Christ's experience supremely on the cross. He cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's another psalm of lament that he's quoting there. And I wonder to some degree if it has been your experience too. Just feeling distant from God. And that disconnection, that distance is heightened by a sense of loss that he is also experiencing. These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Okay, he remembers the sweetness of meeting with other believers. Okay, do you remember that when we could sing together and drink coffee and chat and laugh and comfort each other, praise God together? Actually, meeting with other believers is one of God's gifts to help us and to, um, to grow us in our fellowship with him. And so it's not surprising that when we are cut off from other believers, we can also feel cut off from God as well and this kind of what you might think of as a a small scale loss in this particular believer's life is just a reminder of the ultimate loss of this world that we're living in and our ultimate need of redemption so that's how he's feeling but how does he respond to it well two things um, just for us to finish with um, today first of all he pours out his soul Just pause on that. It's a very evocative phrase. Pour out your soul. Don't bottle your sorrow in, but pour it out before God. He wants to hear. He wants to know. And actually, it's often in the depths where he most powerfully meets with us. So as he remembers his loss, his response there is first to pour out his soul. But secondly, Put your hope in God. He is the God who has promised redemption. That's not a vain hope, but through Christ, a certain hope. As it says here, I will yet praise him. And for a Christian believer, we can go one step further. We will see him. And when we do, he will wipe every tear from our face and sorry and sighing will flee away. But We do need to keep talking to ourselves, persuading ourselves to put our hope in God, telling ourselves to do it. Now, we'll be thinking a little bit more about that over the next few mornings. But for now, I wonder if you might just take a moment today to reflect. Have there been times when you have felt disconnected, cut off from God? Have you grappled with this sense of loss? And have you been able to respond by pouring out your soul and by putting your hope ultimately in God? Let me finish with a prayer. So, Father, thank you so much for uh, 
uh, the hope that you give us in the gospel. And yet it's a hope that comes to us in the midst of a world of sorrows, a world where there is a great loss that we experience. And we pray as we grapple with our own sorrows and our own struggles, our own sense of loss, uh, that we would both be honest with you about those pouring out our souls, but also put our hope consistently in you, knowing that there is redemption and that through Christ we have a certain hope. And we pray that for Jesus' sake. Amen.